Girolamo is our guest today. He is the uh, executive director at LAX, or deputy executive director for operations at uh, Dallas-Fort uh, Worth before he came to LAX, but he has actually been in Los Angeles. I think you're an LA native, right? Uh, went to uh, Cal State Northridge where he got his uh, urban studies degree, like some of you. Went to work for the city of Los Angeles, transferred over to LAX, uh, was exiled to Ontario when that airport started to take off. Then was recruited to go to Dallas, and then when he was in Dallas as deputy director, he was asked to come back to help run LAX. Um, you know, there's a lot of unique aspects about LAX. Some of us take it for granted because we fly in and out of there all the time. Uh, and you don't realize what an incredible uh, um, situation that is. And we're going to have Mr. DiGirolamo talk a little bit about that. Um, why don't you just give us a little bit of background in terms of what you do at the airport, and then we'll ask some questions and have the students ask questions. And by that time, maybe the assembly member will have joined us. Okay. Um, everybody hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, this is a beautiful campus. I really enjoy coming here. It's a privilege to go to school here. I have. Uh, uh, known a lot of people that have gone to school here. My executive assistant's uh, daughter is going to school here now. This is a terrific, terrific facility. Um, my job at Los Angeles is kind of unique. Um, let me go into a little bit what the airport's all about. And Los Angeles International Airport is part of a airport system called Los Angeles World Airports. We are a proprietary department in the city of Los Angeles. What that means is we are independent with regards to financing. All of the money that we generate for our budget is generated through user fees. That's what you pay in the parking lot when you come in, when you buy a soda, uh, a percent of that goes to us. Uh, when you uh, buy a ticket, uh, the way we collect from the airlines is in leases or every time an airplane lands on our runway, we collect. And we have a tremendous budget, which you can imagine. We have about 2,500 employees and another probably 1,500 contract employees working at our four airports. Four airports, LAX, Ontario International, Van Nuys, and Palmdale. Yeah, but who flies out of Palmdale? Uh, nobody right now except the Air Force and a lot of uh, Blackbirds and a lot of top secret projects. It's a joint facility with us and the Air Force. Uh, we've attempted to have service up there, but it just hasn't worked. So when you say 2,500 employees, those are just airport employees, because that doesn't include the employees who work for the airlines. No, those are the airport employees. Uh, at the airport, there's probably about 75,000 employees uh, with the airlines, with the tenants, and uh, with, um, private, well, you're either an airline or you're a tenant, and tenants are service providers. Uh, my job is to make sure that the place and all of the airports run smoothly, uh, responsible for security, for fire, for maintenance, for airfield operations, landside operations, terminal operations, emergency preparedness. If it moves or if it lights up or if it's air conditioned, <laughs> It all comes under my uh, my authority, and we have a we have the largest group. We have an administrative group. We have a uh, properties concessions group, and we have a uh, planning and engineering group. And all four groups work together. Um, you know, just we have the uh, I think it's the fourth largest police force in the county of Los Angeles. So that's the LA, LAPD, uh, sheriffs, it's, Long Beach, and then you guys. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting. I've been doing this for 30 years. LAX is um, the. Well, I got a question. Go. So when you're driving around and you go to the In and Out, can the airport police give you a ticket? Uh, theoretically, yes, because they are sworn officers. Under so remember that, guys. State. When you see airport police, they can still give you a ticket when um, you're driving around here. If a violation, a moving violation, uh, happens and they observe it, and if they're on a public street in the city of Los Angeles, they can issue a, a citation, a ticket, uh, the same as LAPD. So um, we do once in a while issue tickets on Century Boulevard, Sepulveda, Lincoln, uh, for speeding, for uh, erratic driving, and those kind of things. 
So not a lot. Not a lot. What I don't understand though is when you go into LAX, you do see the airport police, but you also see a lot of LAPD in there. Not a lot. We have probably, between our security officers and our police officers, we have about 800. LAPD has about 40, believe yeah, it or yeah. not. But at the checkpoints, that's where, the, where you get screened, you will see an LAPD officer. They are working there at our behest on what is called voluntary overtime. Because we don't have enough officers because we're short about 100 officers. We're having a heck of a time recruiting. LAPD is short about 14 or 1,500 officers. And we have to have an, off, an armed officer at every one of those checkpoints. And in some cases, we have to have two. And so we don't have enough officers. So what we do is we work with LAPD. We have a long list of, of police officers at LAPD and say, do you want to come in and work overtime? So we pay them their overtime to do that, time and a half, to come in and, and they work an eight-hour shift for us at that yeah. checkpoint. They're not on regular duty, but we have about 30 officers, 30, 40 officers that are on duty at the substation there. We also have uh, canines, I'll, I'll get off on this tangent, but we have uh, canines, dogs. We have 31 bomb-sniffing dogs at LAX. That's more than any airport in the world. Um, and we use them a lot. We use them in the terminals. Uh, they're a deterrent, and that's why we have them. We have out at Ontario, we've got six, and we're hoping to get our seventh one out there. We use them to check cargo. Uh, we use them to uh, check suspicious bags. So that's all part of it. We have a 24-7 bomb squad at the airport uh, that checks uh, suspicious items. Uh, we have um, just about anything you can think of. We obviously special fire fighting equipment out there that can handle up to a 747. But LAX is kind of unique. LAX, uh, in, in the world, we are the fourth busiest airport in the world. In the United States, uh, Atlanta, uh, Chicago, Atlanta, and are the two busiest. Remember, those are connecting airports. If anybody's ever flown through Chicago or Atlanta, people get on an airplane and get off. LAX is unique that we have more people get on and off airplanes and go into the city than any other airport in the world. We're the biggest, what is called, origin and destination airport in the world. More people get off an airplane, go into the city, and then come back and get on an airplane. We do connect, about 18% of our passengers connect internationally. Uh, the number two busiest O&D airport in the world. It's a trick question, somewhat. Any ideas? Throughout a city, where you think more people get on and off airplanes and go into a city, anywhere in the world? No. Las Vegas. Second busiest O&D, more people, obviously. Uh, so LA is unique. We're the busiest international air cargo airport in the United States. More international cargo comes through LAX. Uh, Ontario is the 20. 20th busiest cargo airport in the world. Uh, it's a matter, and that's primarily because UPS is out there and they're a big Asian hub. They move a lot of cargo. Van Nuys Airport, General Aviation Airport out in the San Fernando Valley, busiest general aviation airport in the world. So explain general aviation is general, private planes. Yeah, general aviation is, is not a, it's not commercial, obviously. It, and these are people that fly, uh, you know, little, single engine airplanes up to corporate. We have more corporate jets based there than any other airport in Southern California. And when I say corporate jets, we're talking some big airplanes. You can imagine some of these movie stars. We have uh, a lot of uh, business people, Hollywood executives, a lot of big airplanes. It's the eighth busiest airport in the world as far as landings and takeoffs. That's how busy it is at Van Nuys. So that's a, that's a unique so function. You can't have a corporate jet land at LAX? You can, but we don't have any place to base them. In other words, um, I won't mention any names, but there's several uh, high-profile uh, movie producers, movie stars that have their airplanes based at uh, Van Nuys. I can tell you one person who did, who doesn't anymore, and uh, John Travolta. John moved his fleet down to Florida. They built a runway built several houses for aviation buffs around it, <laughs> and he taxis his airplane up literally to his house. And he has an old 707 
uh, that he uses in Qantas colors. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It was in here. He was in here for the Academy Awards. But those are the kind of people that base their airplanes. Uh, less, fewer and fewer movie stars are flying commercially. Um, for the same reason that you love to fly commercially, the hassle. You know, the screening, getting there early, uh, and then having to deal with the paparazzi. Uh, so they more and more are flying uh, private jets and either chartering them, renting them, or it, a lot of movie stars have, your, have their own airplanes. It's really so quite what, amazing. What so what does it cost when a plane lands at LAX, like a Southwest Airlines 737? Every time it uh, lands, how much do you guys charge them? Well, what it's based on, it's called, uh, we set a landing fee. Right now, it's around $3, okay? That's $3 for every 1,000 pounds of what is called a gross landing weight. Every airplane, when it's empty and it's on the ground, has a weight, and that's published. So we use that published weight, calculate every time they come in, okay, and then we set the landing fee, and the landing fee is based on our costs. It's, it's, it, there's three elements that we generate money. One is concessions, which is 50%. 25% from leases and 25% from landing fees. So we adjust the landing fees, we adjust the terminal rental rates, and the concessions, we can adjust the parking a little bit. We make at LAX $40 million a year, no, $50 million a year in parking revenue, just from our parking. Uh, and we adjust that rate based on our needs, and we adjust the rate based on, on uh, our fees, that we need to charge back to the carriers. So, so how much does it cost them with the 737? So, um, it's probably about a hundred and, it's not that expensive, maybe about $175. That is it. Dollars. Now, a 747 coming to LA is about $600. That same airplane, when it lands in Tokyo, it's $10,000. Okay, so that, that actually that was going to be my point. Why, if we're so busy and there's such a great demand and everybody's complaining about too many people flying in here, and it's really a monopoly in a sense, why are we only charging $600 when Tokyo charges $10,000? Because we are a nonprofit organization <laughs> of the city of Los Angeles. We do not charge more than, uh, we're, we're not looking, we do generate an operating income, mm -hmm. but we're not out there to operate and make money if we were privatized. Okay. But in There's part no that, tax dollars. Yeah. In part, that's what kind of irritates some of the Westchester residents who say, hey, we put up with 75,000 people going to work there with other 60 million people traveling out of there every single year, all the traffic, et cetera. And, you know, you guys refuse to spend a penny on Westchester. And you can charge so much more money. You could pay for everything in Westchester. That's, a, that's a good point. Um, we get... I don't know, probably a hundred million dollars from the federal government in, I'll call it subsidies. It, it, it's, uh, it's money for runways, it's money for safety. The FAA control tower, those are the people that control the airplanes, that's an FAA function. The inspectors that are, that are inspecting us and the airlines. So many, many years ago, the FAA said, look, if money, if we're putting federal money into the airport, it can't no money should come out of that airport. It has to stay there for the... Okay, but wait, so they're okay, saying... So, so they're saying it has to be used for the betterment of aviation in the United States and the air transportation system. Mayor Reardon, who was several mayors ago, tried to divert some of our general fund money out of the city down to City Hall. Um, after about a year of battling with the federal government, he gave up, and the city council, it's a true story, uh, there was $30 million in question, and it had to do with the Century Freeway. And we actually justified, and the attorneys justified, probably about $20 million of that should have gone to the city. The city council was so paranoid of the federal government that they would cut off every other federal fund going into the city of Los Angeles. They said, we're not even going to debate it. You get the $30 million back. That's how powerful the federal government is. And the airlines, they raise a big stink about it. 
we have just come into a, a community settlement agreement where there's going to be a lot of money that is going to go into the community. We had to get the FAA to buy off on that. And the FAA said that will bring peace to LAX because LAX is a very important airport. So it's worth the millions of dollars that you're going to spend in the community because we need to have LAX as a viable transportation center in the West, Western United States. So consequently, they agreed and they totally set precedent on, on doing this and allowing this to happen. No other airport. Of course, the airlines were furious. That's another whole subject for economics and who pays and who's subsidizing who and, you know, my personal, uh, let me draw an analogy and, and hopefully you'll understand. I've used this in the past, I've used it in a long time. If you can imagine Ralph's Markets, uh, most of you are familiar with Ralph's Markets, coming into the city of Los Angeles and going to the mayor and says, hey, we've identified a piece of property. We would like you to buy the property, build us a supermarket, secure it, make sure that it's policed, make sure that it's maintained. We'll come in, sell our groceries, and we'll give you a return on your investment over the next 200 years. Now, what do you think the city's going to say? Probably not, but that's effectively way, the way airports started. You know, we had train stations, and you built a train station to attract trains, okay? Well, they figured, these are in the air. Why don't we do the same thing? So cities went into the airport business for the same way. Some of the first airports back east, LaGuardia and, and uh, Idlewild. So we did that and we did things to encourage the airlines to operate. It was a monopoly under the Civil Aeronautics Board many up until 1978. And so the airports became railroad stations in some respects and we subsidized and to this day, we subsidize indirectly and directly the airlines. So, I mean, it's really politics because the airlines all have lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and they all pay, and the FAA is controlled by the uh, uh, subcommittee of the Transportation uh, Committee that controls air, and, and they, yeah. they all uh, um, contribute to the congressmen in those districts that don't live around L.A., and they control LAX. And they're basically, uh, the airlines pay hundreds and thousands of dollars to politicians to save hundreds of millions of dollars in potential landing fees. Uh, I read a piece, I think it was in... Uh, I can say that because I have tenure. He doesn't it, have it tenure. Might, no, actually, I, I do. I can retire at any time oh. and walk away. Thank you. I have my 30 years in. But uh, um, I read, in, I think it was, might have been Forbes magazine several, several years ago, that one of the top five most powerful lobbies in Washington was ATA, Air Transport Association, which represents the airlines. And they basically wrap the FAA around their fingers uh, and get what they want from them. And uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. But um, hey, talk about the, the new A380 plane, and then I'll have some, some students question, ask questions about what they love about LAX. Um, the A380 is this uh, large, Next generation airport. Let me ask the students, how many of you have heard of the A380? Raise your hand. It's Airbus A380, the super jumbo jet that oh. is being built in, Paris, in uh, France, let's say Paris, in uh, Toulouse, France. Um, it, it's a 747. And if you've seen a 747, it has one deck and it has a very small deck up at the top. Well, this is double decked all the way. It can hold, depending on the configuration, most of the airlines are going to run about 550 passengers. Some will be a 600. If Southwest wants to fly it, I'm sure there'll be 2,000 people. <laughs> so, uh, that's a lot of people. It is a big airplane. It is having a big impact on airports, not so much from the weight, but because of the wingspan. 747 wingspan, people don't think about this, this is what we deal with every day. Wingspan of a 747 is 219 feet, okay? And that's the largest wingspan of any airplane that we have on the airport. The A380 is 267 feet. But what does that mean? Well, it means that wing is going to be over taxiways, creating a problem for an airplane taxiing on the next taxiway. We have parallel taxiways that you can put two 747s on. But you're not going to be able to put an A380 on one taxiway and have a 747 pass it on the other because the wing tip clearance is too close and may cause 
problem. So we're having to deal with how we're going to deal with that and air traffic controllers who are going to move these airplanes around on the field are going to have to figure out how we're going to move these around and not impact everybody. So, but the point here though is that you've got Airbus in Europe building them and the airlines buying them, but you will pay everything to get them to be able to yeah. move them around. They didn't come to us and say, hey, look, you mind spending about $500 million to fix the place up so this airplane can land? No. Uh, they just showed up and said it's coming. And so the previous mayor attitude was, who needs this airplane and why are they building it? So nothing was done. Now the new mayor says, hey, it's important. Airlines serve markets, not airports. That's critical. LAX is the most lucrative, financially sound market in the world for the airlines. The airlines make more money per passenger from LAX flying either domestically or internationally than any other airport in the world. Okay? So again, why don't we raise the fees? Because you can't, because there is a long meet and confer process with the airlines on, on raising fees. I mean, we can raise the fee a quarter, you know, here and, and a dollar there, but when you start getting above that to generate any kind of real money, it, it's problematic. And um, there's two ways that you finance airport. One is called a residual, the other is called compensatory. A residual is what we have in Ontario. We had to get the airlines to buy in to spending a lot of money and getting bonds to build a $300 million terminal, new terminal in Ontario. For them to do that, they wanted what is called a residual agreement. In other words, any operating income that would be made, because a whole lot of people show up and they park and they buy a lot of Cokes, goes back to them as far as lower landing fees the next year. So they, they get that money back. So it's zero-based budget. If we go over our budget, they have to make up the difference. But if there's an operating income, they get that operating income. We cannot use it. And they have what is called a majority and interest clause in, in this agreement, which says if we want to build anything over $4 million, we have to get 75% approval from the airlines to do it. Now, here again, this was the old days when I was talking about the train stations and how we encouraged people to come in, or airlines to come in and serve your airport. LA had the same agreement up until 1992. We went away with it. Now we have what is called a compensatory. And that is, we can charge whatever we want to charge, okay? And as I said, we have the three components. We have landing fees, leases, and concessions. At the end of the day, if there's an operating income, we can keep it. If it's too much of an operating income, we'll hear it from the airlines. And they'll go to Washington and start complaining that these people are overcharging us, you know. And so it, it, it's a very difficult situation uh, to try to maintain. As long as we maintain a zero-based budget, we're okay. And, uh, but we do, you know, last year we made, because we were very efficient, we made about $18 million at Los Angeles, okay. Uh, employees don't get a raise, and there's no bonuses. It just goes into our general fund, and we can use it any way we want. We don't have to get airline approval to use it. But if we go out for a major construction project to rebuild a new terminal, and we have to go out and get bonds, the airlines then have a lot of input and a lot of say in exactly how much they're willing to pay. It's, it's kind of interesting what's, what's going on. Uh, we had the events of 9-11. We had an industry that was very productive, that was doing a lot of things prior to 9-11. Since 9-11, the industry's changed dramatically. Um, we're the only airport in the United States since 9-11 that has not recovered our passengers on the domestic side. And because of Orange County, Ontario, and Burbank, and Long Beach. A lot of the traffic is going off to those other airports. That's a good thing, right? Yeah. John Wayne, real quick, LAX, 15% of our total passengers come out of Orange County. Okay? That was up close to 25%. Orange County is very affluent. People would come up. The reason we get 15% is primarily international 
Hawaii, those. But John Wayne's doing more. They're pushing their limits. Just 10 years ago, they had a limit of about 5 million. They're pushing 8 million through there. Uh, they're putting a lot of people through Long Beach that were never there. Our so when you say 8 million, that means 8 million people went into Orange County, or is it really like 4 million went in and 4 million came out? So it, Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. It's like we did 61, so split it in half, it's 30 and 30. Okay. Um, so we're looking at, at all of our options. We just have not grown the way we have. Uh, we had a series of master plans that were looked at, and this question, that same question was asked 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and the Reardon administration attempted to move forward with a master plan. And uh, fortunately, all I had to worry about was running the place, not getting into the politics of the master plan and, and a lot of those issues. Obviously, I was asked my expertise on, on operational safety and security issues. But Reardon had a plan, and it was going along, and they kind of ran into a buzzsaw in the community. Then Mayor Hahn came in and he did a 180 and he wanted to go in a totally different direction with a totally different master plan. We spent four years developing that. The new mayor came in and said, Veragosa said, this is a joke. You know, everybody says this won't work. And we got the communities just totally upset with us. So the first thing he said was, the master plan as we know it is dead, okay? But what we want to do is we want to go ahead and get an agreement with the community to develop the airport or modernize the airport with some limits. And so we have a plan to move forward over the next three years. And then we are doing, we're taking a look at the current master plan since we got it approved and everybody agreed to it. it it's basically an environmental document is what it is. When we say master plan, yeah, it's got buildings here and buildings there. But it's all of the environmental documentation that goes along with that. We ask the communities to support that because within that, it gives us the leeway to go ahead and do a few projects. Not the massive projects that Han was going to do, which really had the community upset. In fact, I never thought I would hear the mayor of El Segundo tell us that rebuilding the runway on the south side was the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, a year before he was saying over my dead body, uh, well, we <laughs> I won't go there, but, but uh, there was some clear changes in attitude and we're working with the community, we're doing outreach, community uh, development with regards to uh, what this is gonna look like. So we do have a plan. <clears throat> And that, and that will raise from 60 million to 80 million? Well, remember, airlines serve markets. We don't know who is gonna show up at that airport. We are down significantly in operations, just a point. In 2000, we had 2,200 operations a day. An operation is a landing and a takeoff. So okay. we had 2,000 planes. 2,200 planes in, in 2000 landed and took off. So right. how many is that an average a minute? Um, well, we're running we, on busy peak times. Peak times, we're, we're 60 inbound and 60 outbound. So in, a, in uh, one hour? In an hour. So that means a minute? Yeah. Every, a plane is during every minute? During peak times. Obviously, from midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning, there's only about 150 operations. Today, we're only operating at 1,700 flights. Well, that's a reflection of the industry, and that's a whole other course in economics and what's going on in that industry. Well, that, in that case, let me ask uh, Dr. Singleton to ask. The city of Los Angeles, many years ago, when they developed that airport and built what you see today in 1960, was to encourage airplanes to come to Los Angeles because of the economic benefits that it would provide. Today, we see that with Southwest. Southwest will go into a city that, where the airfares are high and it's underutilized, overpriced and underutilized is what they call it, okay? Sacramento is a prime example. I've seen, the traffic in Sacramento has tripled in the last 15 years because of Southwest. They lower the airfares, they encourage people to fly. And uh, uh, there was an interesting article that an economist wrote, and I, I think it's very, very profound. 
and that is people fly for economic reasons or uneconomic reasons. An uneconomic reason is, in, you know, a couple of years ago, you'd open the page and say, gee, it's $69 to, you know, Des Moines, Iowa. And they said, let's get some tickets to Des Moines, Iowa. And the wife would say, we don't know anybody in Des Moines, Iowa. But for $69, we're going to Des Moines, Iowa. Those people were flying for uneconomic you reasons. You couldn't pay me $69 okay. to go to But people <laughs> did do it. Versus an economic reason is, OK, uh, we're going to go to Orlando because we want to go to Disney World. Uh, I have to go to graduation. Uh, I have to go to a funeral. I have to go to a wedding. Those people are willing to pay whatever the economic rate is. So there was this debate. Are we developing airports? And this is what happened after deregulation, that you're all, they're becoming bus stations because of the low airfares versus people who are flying for economic reasons. But for every passenger that comes into Los Angeles, the economic benefit to the city of Los Angeles is, is close to $1,000. For every ton of cargo, it's $5,000 in direct and indirect benefits to the, to the region, not the city. Dr. Everybody. Uh, Dr. Blixley had a question. Hi. Airlines serve markets, not airports. They can build whatever they want to build, but the, the Asian carriers will tell you San Francisco is a horrible place for two reasons. They don't have the O&D business, and they don't have the connections. San Fr Southwest does not fly into San Francisco, OK? Super Shuttle, which is the sh one of the shuttle companies, moves 1,500 people a day between San Francisco and Oakland. Because 20% of the passengers that come in on Southwest are connecting to the Asian carriers in coach. I mean, that's a whole other dynamic that's working. These, these are interesting economics. You know, Southwest is very important to Los Angeles because it brings in a lot of international passengers that are connecting, or domestic passengers connecting to the international. You know, everybody assumes that all these international passengers are flying business in first class. Yeah, well, they'll fly on Delta and American and United. But a lot of the people out of Asia who fly in coach their tickets have been bought through brokers and expediters, and they're, they're paying very inexpensive tickets to and from Asia. When they get here, they, they're looking for an inexpensive ticket to Vegas, Phoenix, Houston, wherever they're going, and Southwest offers that to them. So there's, there's those interesting dynamics. Uh, airport Security 101. LA International Airport is the only airport that had an Al Qaeda plot it was foiled, but it was an Al-Qaeda plot against this airport, okay? The level of security that we provide, the national security agencies will tell you that LAX is the most secure airport in the United States. We had a situation that developed a year ago, I won't go into too many details, but a pseudo-terrorist was questioned about an activity at the airport and in Southern California, and they basically said, we crossed LAX off the list very early because it was too hardened to target. Uh, with the amount of officers, dogs, police that I have out here, it's, it's the most policed, you know, 2,000 acres in, the LA, in, you know, in Southern California. I mean, it's... Given the repercussions that this would have on the national economy, You mean for Homeland Security? Yeah, at LAX. We do not rely on them. We have, airports have to provide their own level of security. Okay. Yeah, way, way in the back. Stand up and project. Hi. Um, oh, that's I was good. Ask you, it, saying everything that you just been saying, do you feel like um, the airport is less of a threat than the port? The longer you can LA, you feel like? It depends. We do a lot of threat assessment. Yeah, Southern California is probably next to the New York metropolitan area, the two most secured areas in the United States. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but we have task force, we have uh, threat terrorist uh, groups that meet on a regular basis. What we're worried about in the ports is from the obvious 
of people trying to sneak weapons of mass destruction through the port. You're not going to get them through the airport, okay, because of the level of security. Not only at our end, but on the other end, they're checked, the cargo's checked, because we have less amount of cargo. Interesting point. We only have, when you look at the port of Los Angeles, they bring in 90% of the total weight of imports. We're just talking weight now, not value, okay? We have 10%. But our 10% is twice as much as that 90% in terms of value. In terms of value. Yeah. And the stuff that we bring into the airport. Right. Any other questions? Let me ask you one last question before we turn to the assembly member. What will ha I mean, in five years, get, given 9-11, given all the bankruptcies and the problems that we have with the airlines, I think Southwest Airlines is the only one that's turned a profit lately and, and barely. JetBlue just announced for the first time that they lost a lot of money. Um, what, what do you see, ha and then the, you know, the advent of the new uh, A380 and all that, what do you see in the next four or five years for LAX and for aviation? Well, that seems to be the $10,000 question. If I could answer that, I would re retire right now and open a consulting company. Uh, we're going to see consolidation of airlines. We will see the airlines pulling seats out of the market to try to generate uh, higher yield on every seat. Okay? We're seeing that now at LA. As I said, we went from 2,200 down to 1,700. Primary reason is they're trying to get more money for those seats. Fuel costs aren't going anywhere but up. So they're looking for economic airplanes. They're getting the days of the cheap airfare. I can remember my daughter goes to Chico, uh, Chico State, and fly up there. I could get up there a year ago for $39 one way. You should know this. You know, in, in Southwest now, the cheap airfare, the cheapest airfare in that market right now is $59, because they've added two <coughs> rate hikes because of fuel costs. Right. So the, the, the days of the $39 airfare are gone. It's, you know. So LA just had a record-breaking international uh, passenger year. We had more international passengers, and yet domestic was down. But we're looking to move the traffic. And when I say move the traffic, we just want the people that live around John Wayne, that live around Ontario, to use those airports. Palmdale will develop when the market matures. We don't want them all coming into Los Angeles. So we're not terribly upset that those numbers are down. Obviously, we're an international gateway. The international commerce and, and the uh, passengers that come in, some of the Asian carriers, 95% of the passengers that they bring in are passengers from either their country or uh, US citizens are living here, going back to their country. So, those dynamics are very important, and that's, that will have to be critical to this airport, plus the ability to connect and let the other airports grow and develop as they need to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the A380 is an aberration, which is, the reason they built the airplane is because airports around the world are restricted. LA, fortunately, is not restricted. Some airports have curfews, believe it or not, around the world. And so, or you can only land, London is a restricted airport. There's only so many flights allowed a day into London. Virgin Atlantic has two flights a day from London to Los Angeles. They cannot add a third. They've got two 747s on the flight. They can't go to a bigger airplane unless they buy the A380. So that's what they're doing, why they're doing it, so that they can fly to LA with more passengers. Qantas is doing the same thing with Sydney. Sydney is a restricted airport. They're flying five flights a day between LA and Australia. They don't want to put more flights on, 747s, so they can carry more passengers with an A380. So there's a lot of dynamics. It's a whole, yeah. <laughs> it's almost a whole uh, class uh, on that. On aviation. So, yeah, uh, Cornelius, we're going to wait on, on your question. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a good friend, uh, Jenny Oropesa, who is the uh, state assembly member representing uh, <coughs> Long Beach, Carson, uh, part of Lomita in that area. Before she was elected, Wilmington, Wilmington Harbor yeah, where's City. The, where's someone from Wilmington? There's someone Harbor from, Gateway. Two or three people. Lakewood. Okay, I forgot a couple of communities. Um, she first represented Long Beach on the uh, school district. And after a couple years there, she was elected six to the- Six years. Six years. Uh, and after that, 
those great six years in the school district, she was elected to the uh, Long Beach City Council for uh, some a number of years. Seven years. Seven years. And, and then now she's been on the uh, assembly for uh, five, and five, half. five and a half years. <laughs> okay. uh, she's currently a candidate for the uh, state senate. As you know, in California, we have a bicameral legislature, the assembly. There are 80 members. She is one of 80. And then we have a state senate where there are 40 members. And she's hoping to be one of 40. Uh, the district goes all the way from all the way down to Long Beach. And it actually passes right by here and goes up to Venice. The boundary is actually Lincoln Boulevard. Loyola Marymount University literally borders, but if you cross the street and go to the other side of Westchester, that would be enough. yeah, that would be, that would be her district. It's a um, currently held by State Senator Deborah Bowman, who is running for Secretary of State, and uh, she is running against another a former uh, Assembly member, from, a former City Council member from Torrance, and it's the the it's a Democratic seat. So whoever wins in June will probably win in, in November. So the election really is in June. Um, and so she's been busy campaigning, raising money. She's raised a lot of money. She's yep. raised like uh, a lot of money. Yeah. Well, how much? Well, the report actually, interesting, you would ask. It's just a number. Report, it's just a number. I wish it was just a number. Uh, the report came out today, the most current cash on hand report. And so as of today, I have cash on hand uh, to spend of $487,000, but I've actually raised a lot more than that because we've spent some. So I've raised well over a half a million dollars, probably about $600,000, but our budget is $800,000. So if any of you have some extra change lying around. <laughs> but you know, what, what's important about money though, money is to really get people out. And what's much more helpful than money sometimes are volunteers. Yep. Okay. And you will all be leaving class or semester ends on uh, Cinco de Mayo. May, really? May, yeah, May 5th, big party. Um, big party? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and the, the election is June. June, June 6th, so there is, and that's the most intensive time for yeah. the campaign. So for any of you who are interested in that's working in working in a campaign, uh, you, you might want to be interested in, in, in this campaign right around our neighborhood, okay? Venice, parts of Westchester, El Segundo, et cetera. Okay, and so we'll, maybe if you're interested afterwards, we can ha have some of you talk. Let me tell you, we had Jose Wizar here, not in this, uh, class but in another event on campus uh, last week and yeah and you know the first thing he said to me is he said hey where is uh, uh, the student that he asked for and I said uh, oh how do you know him he said he volunteered in my campaign and he was there and he came all the time and I just remember he was from Loyola Marymount he said he was one of your students I said yeah he is he goes hey well I have a job and I'd like to see if he would like to apply for that job and because he became familiar with him during the campaign, watched his work ethic, watched his uh, uh, intelligence and the great Loyola Marymount University education that he was willing to uh, recruit. So if you get the hint that I'm talking about. Well, you that know I've hired, you know I've hired. We've hired a two of my former students, you, that's yeah. right. So, um, so anyway, uh, Assembly Member Oropesa used to be the chair of the budget, uh, uh, over a hundred billion dollar budget in the state of California. Right now, she is the chairperson of the transportation committee for the uh, state assembly. And uh, one of the things that we're talking about is transportation, the harbor. She also represented, or was very close to representing the harbor when you were on the city council. Yep. And so she knows all about transportation. She was also and part airports. of, right? She also headed the Goods Movements Committee when she was on the Southern California Association of Governments. And she was also a member of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the MTA or the buses, when she was here in, in, in LA County. So she's all about transportation. We tend to associate transportation with, um, you know, uh, males and, you know, white guys like, uh, like him, right? And <laughs> we don't tend to think of uh, 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 Latinas being involved Man in women yeah. and Latinas being involved in, uh, in transportation and infrastructure <laughs> issues. But here you have a person whose public policy career really has been around transportation, goods movements, and, and things of that nature. Um, and so 
uh, Assemblywoman Aura Pesa was also asked by the state legislature and the governor to carry the infrastructure uh, um, bill that would have, the bond, that would have put the bond on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And so the first question I want to ask you is, what happened? It was supposed to be on the June ballot, but uh, yeah. all the Democrats seemed to vote voted for it, but the Republicans from the governor's own party kind of refused to support. So right. what's, the, what's the deal with that? Well, what happened was, uh, you guys probably know that the governor in January uh, in his state of the state address said that he wanted to prioritize, he wanted to have this mega bond, right? That was his big program for this year that he was gonna focus on infrastructure and in a big way. So it wasn't just gonna be transportation, although transportation was a big piece of it. He also wanted to focus on education, on levees because of the flooding that happened in uh, New Orleans. I think that really brought to mind for a lot of us in California that we have a levee system here that needed help. And also uh, he wanted to focus, let's see, mainly transportation levees, Oh, prisons, he wanted to build more prisons. He wanted to build more jails. How about schools? Uh, and schools. And you know, uh, he wanted to put some money into universities and, and schools and transportation. Those were his priorities. So um, we went to work. It requires, in order to put a bond on the ballot, it requires two thirds vote of the legislature, okay? So it required us to all work together. Uh, Democrats do not hold a two-thirds vote of the legislature. We hold a majority, but we, it requires agreement between Democrats and Republicans. So we got to work. So but wait a minute, there are 80 seats, so two-thirds would be 54. That's right, it Demo requires 54 votes. And Democrats are 48. That's correct. So we only have 48, we need six Republicans. So of the 32 Republicans, you need to get six Republicans to vote for you guys. Correct. And, that, and that will give you the two-thirds. Correct. So the governor had to deliver, um, well, uh, if every Democrat went up on every piece of it, uh, then, the Demo then the Republicans would need six votes. But it, let me just tell you quickly what happened. What happened was, first, the Democrats didn't think that infrastructure just for those, well, first of all, we didn't think we need to build more prisons, okay? We thought we had enough prisons and that that what we needed to do was build more, that, that we needed to build more in the area of parks, and that we needed to invest in uh, our environment, that we needed to invest more in air quality. My personal view was that, um, that the transportation bond only looked at building highways and it didn't invest enough in uh, transit. Uh, like mass transit or ways of uh, doing rail or other kinds of, or buses or other kinds of ways of getting people out of their cars because you can't, we really literally as a state can't build our way out of our congestion <coughs> problem. And also I felt that we needed to create a nexus in our funding between, I want to stand up, can I do that? Because I can't you're see the assembly everybody member. back there. I can't see him. I can project, but I can't see everybody back there. Um, that we need hey, so to, wake up, we're in the back. So we need to create a better nexus uh, in policy at the state level between the dollars we invest in highways and other kinds of transportation, airports or whatever we do in moving people and goods around, and the pollution that that creates, because it creates pollution so we should create, we should invest dollars, right, in cleaning up that pollution. So there should be like, I don't know if it's a dollar for dollar, or 50 cents for every dollar, or something, but the state should recognize and financially invest in cleaning up the pollution we create as we invest in more transportation infrastructure. So. That was my agenda, all right? That was one of my agendas. And so, as we went forward on the negotiations for the bond for transportation, I said, and we called it the greening, the greening of the bond proposal. And, and that meant generally, you know, to bring more environmental concern into the bonds. In so what that really meant is you were gonna spend more money. No, we what? were gonna spend the money differently. Oh, okay. We well, but the Republicans, let me ask you this. Were the Republicans willing to go along if you had 
pick, uh, not uh, greed the, the bond measure? Say again? Another, okay. um, would the Republicans have gone along with the original Schwarzenegger proposal? Uh, no, they were not happy with the original Schwarzenegger what proposal. Would it, what would it have taken for the Republican legislators to go along? I don't they, know. They're never going to go along. I don't know what the Republicans wanted. I wasn't in the room. All I know is we started out with some proposals to change the bond. And, we, and the governor wanted to work with us. Okay, because we're the, we have the more votes, right? Mm -hmm. We have 48 votes. But not enough. But not enough. But the governor believed that he could deliver his five or six votes or his seven votes, votes okay? So he, he negotiated with us. There's this thing called the big five. The big five is the governor and the leaders of both parties in both houses. And they're, they're the people who negotiate in the end on making a deal. They go back to their respective groups and check it out, say, you know, is this, uh, are you okay with what we're negotiating? And then they go back to the table and they negotiate. So our leader, Fabian Nunez in the assembly, checks it out with us. We say, yes, these are our priorities. We want to green the bond. We want to add more money for community colleges. We want to do this and that. And we had our package and we went and we negotiated with the governor. And the governor says, okay, these are the things I'll go with. These are the things I won't go with. We make a deal. He says, fine. He negotiates with us, and, then, and he negotiates with the other parties, and he says, OK, on this day, on this Monday, I'm ready to go. I've got my assembly votes. I've got my, my uh, Republican votes. You go forth. My, our speaker comes into our caucus meeting. Caucus is a private discussion of just the Democrats. I swear to goodness, this is exactly what happens. We're in there munching on our lunch, okay? And the, and the speaker comes in and he says, okay, here's the deal. These are the deal points. The governor says that he's got uh, six, uh, he's got more than six Republicans, because we had a couple, we had one, one Democrat who did not want to vote on the bill. But who was that? I don't know. He didn't tell us. But there was one, one Democrat who was not going to vote on it. And we also had one Democrat who was out because her mother died. And so we had a courtesy vote. Somebody was going to vote out of courtesy for her on the Republican side, he said. And then the votes, the other Republican votes. And the governor assured us that was fine. So speaker comes back, you know, goes away to talk to the governor after he's given us the deal points. And he goes away down to speak to the governor. He comes back. Governor says he's got the votes. Speaker says, OK. He comes in, reports to us. And then the, the Republicans are meeting in another room right down the hall. And the speaker says, OK, I'm going to go check it out with the Republicans. And they're meeting the same as us. I'm just going to go confirm with them. So he goes by himself? So he goes by himself. No backup? No backup. <laughs> he goes by himself. He goes into the meeting. And he says to the Republican caucus, he says, uh, I was just with the governor. Uh, we've got our votes. I just am here to confirm that you guys have uh, the eight votes that we need, uh, the minimum of eight votes that the governor says you need. So um, I want to confirm that. And so who's going up on it? Silence. Not one hand goes up. Not one. Not even the leader of the minority party. Not even the guy who'd been negotiating with the governor on behalf of the Republican Party. Not one. So they abandoned him. So they abandoned their own governor. Not one of them would vote, and the whole thing fell apart. That's what happened. So no infrastructure. Long story short, I'm sorry, but that is the story. So now we're back to square one. That was for the June ballot. We might get something for November, but you know what? Guess what's happening in November? The, the governor's. governor's election. So guess how much chance we have then of getting a bond when everything is covered with politics? Snowball's chance and you know what. So I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath. And Dr. Guerra, I fear that a chance has slipped through our fingers, and I'm so then, troubled uh, so, and sad. So what do you think of the governor, then? I mean, besides being a girly man when he has to deliver <laughs> Republican votes, I mean, what, what's, uh, what's well, the deal with that? Well, the governor is in uh, much the, I, I, 
and, hey, and so how many have you interacted with him? Oh, I have been interacted with him a lot. When he first came, um, he, he when he first came into office, I was chair of the budget committee. And as you may recall, back at that time, we had a deficit, a big deficit, and he came in and he wanted to do mid-year cuts, and, so, and we were negotiating, and so I didn't spend a lot of time with him. He's a very interesting fellow. He's very driven by image. He doesn't really, he, it's all about making the deal, and I don't think he really has a center core. You know, he wants, he, he really is about the image. That's my view. Did you get his autograph? No, I didn't get his autograph. I've never seen any of his movies except Twins, which I loved. I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a really funny movie. I highly recommend it if any of you haven't seen uh, it. Uh, Academy Award material. Um, him and Danny DeVito. He was really funny. Um, anyway, so what was your question? Uh, whether, whether he had his autograph or not. No, <laughs> I don't have his autograph. He, you know, he is fit for his age, although he does color his hair and he does wear lifts. Uh, actually, I don't know if he wears lifts. He wears cowboy boots all the time. All yes. the time. Uh, to just give him a little extra height because he's not that tall. And he does color his hair. And I think he's... He does. It's a very odd color. I know no other politician who colors their hair. I uh, color mine, too. Oh. <laughs> I admit it. Uh, but he's got like a very odd shade of uh, reddish brown hair, which is clearly not natural. So... <laughs> I'm just being honest. Okay. So, hey, let's, let's get some questions here. Uh, Dr. Singleton. Were, were you ever able to ascertain whether or not he hunched back votes or whether he never had votes? I don't believe he ever had the votes. I believe he thought that, I believe he thought that because they were Republicans, they would follow him. And I think that what's going on, Dr. Garrett asked this question, I didn't really answer it. I believe that what's going on with him is what's going on with Mr. Bush at the federal level and that there's a point in your tenure as the leader, governor, president, whatever, that unless you have really been on your toes and really had the pulse of the people, that uh, the people who are running for other office below you abandon you because they're hearing the people and they're caring about their own skin. And they will just cut you off and go their own way. And I think that's what happened, has happened to this governor because he's totally out of touch with, with the viewpoint of Californians and, and most of the legislators are caring about getting reelected uh, and the Republicans are caring about getting reelected. They don't want to be associated with him. Questions? Is he going to win reelection? Well, right now his numbers are terrible. Now, and do you think he's going to win reelection? It's too hard to predict because the guy is really very good at, yeah, at pulling rabbits out of the hat. Can so interpret, I wouldn't predict. Can you interpret that for the student? Was that a yes or a no? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't a yes or you, no, it wasn't a no. No, it wasn't a yes or a no. <laughs> it was I wouldn't put money on it either way. Okay. Hey, Cornelius. Hey, who, who, do you think Schwarzenegger is going to win re-election? What are you, a politician as well as to yes or no? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I think you're right. <laughs> he didn't say anything. How could he, he said he that? didn't know. Uh, we have a former member of the MCA board, um, the new ex-MCA ex board. The new MCA MTA board. MTA board. Oh, okay. The new MCA board. Do you support that? How much yes, I do. Um... I don't know how much I, I don't know how much money's been devoted to the Expo line. The Expo line's been on the books since I was on the MTA board. I supported it then, and I support it now. And I've talked with uh, Mayor Villaraigosa about it and about making. I know it's the next priority, and I know that we want to jumpstart it. And I'm all for that. I'm all for that. I'm absolutely on board with it, and we want to try and get some additional money into the coffers to get it going. Hey, Absolutely. So you, you don't, I think tomorrow we're having uh, student body elections, aren't we? I heard about that. How exciting, how interesting. Not really. But no, it is. This whole thing about your write-in candidate. And is anybody here on the elections board or on the, on the whatever? You know what? Let the people's voice be heard. Let the people's voice be heard. That's my two cents. Sorry. Let the people's voice be heard, you know. We don't need any outsiders Sorry. telling us how to run our elections. Well, 
I'm sorry. Who's running? Is anybody running in here for anything? Daniel. Cool. Awesome. You know, I was in student government. That's it's a great way to it's a great way to begin and to learn. <laughs> Cornelius got kicked off the ballot? Yeah. I don't want to run. Okay. Yeah, right. I started actually my first office was as elections commissioner and I got and I had the best voter turnout ever. Why? Because I gave out free ice cream with yeah, your so voter you're stub. Right now and, uh, you had your voter stub. I cut a deal with the guy, the vendor on campus who agreed to give free ice cream scoop with the voter stub. Best voter turnout ever. So you were student body president? I was also student body president twice, imagine. Like, who would you ever be satisfied with for a second term? Yeah. It happened to me. I was very lucky. So, so, what, what, so what, got you, what got you involved in politics? Besides, I mean, once you well, the first issue that I ever worked on in politics was a, as a student was uh, there was an initiative on the ballot back in the day. Ooh, a long time ago, you guys weren't born yet, I don't think. And it had to do with teachers. And there was an initiative on the ballot that would have not allowed, it was called Proposition 6, the Briggs Initiative. And it was authored by this guy named Senator Briggs, who was anti-gay. And he, it, the bill, the law would have not allowed any homosexual to be a teacher in the state of California. And we thought that that was wrong, and so uh, a bunch of students developed a coalition on campus with faculty and staff and community, and we fought that initiative, and it failed. I am a candidate myself, and because I'm a candidate in a tough race, I've chosen not, basically not to endorse in almost any race at all. And, and because, uh, that means I have winners and losers, uh, you know, in my own district. I got people who are going to choose on both sides, and when they see me picking a side, then maybe they're going to say, oh, well, I don't like her because she likes him. And it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a winner for me as a candidate. So that's why I'm not endorsing. Both candidates are not very happy about that. They're, I'm friends with both of them. I've worked with both of them. They are both good candidates. You're right. They are both strong candidates, and they both would beat the heck out of Schwarzenegger as a governor. They would both be way outstanding. To answer your question. Oh, good. We're getting an answer. We tried at the beginning. What's your implication? Nothing. <laughs> I've been answering the questions. Um, we tried at the front end to get one candidate. We tried to work with the two candidates to encourage one of, only one of them to run because that's really, uh, that saves a lot of heartache and, you know, one of the two candidates has been paying a lot more dues than the other, frankly. Um, has been in, you know, going through the, the steps, in, in essence. Um, but that was not to be. And then you look at democracy, small d, right? And you say everybody has a right to vote. I mean, right to run, and there's not much we can do about it beyond that, except to encourage them not to beat each other up too much, and to, to work it on the issues, and to stay, you know, non-personal, and to deal on the issues, and to try and talk about what issues they may differ on, and to not get in the dirt. Uh, and that's the best way for us to encourage them to be, and we do do that. Yes. 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 Yes, and I think that's a conscious decision. Uh, Dr. Thank Mar you. Dr. Marks? She wants to fly out of um, LAX or Long Beach. Unfortunately, at this point, there are no flights from Long Beach to Sacramento. I would love to be able to fly out of Long Beach and not have to, no offense, go to Los Angeles. But right now, I fly out of Los He'd Angeles. He'd be happy for that. Yeah. I just came from Los Angeles to get here, actually. I just flew in. Uh, how's, how's Sorry? How's he doing? How's he doing? Uh, well, they provide good uh, service to legislators. Thank you very much. Special services. Um, well, and, we need special services. We do have special services. Like, like what? As they have a, a parking lot that we can park in, thank for God. Free? Uh, yeah. 
you know, elected officials' time is valuable, and we yeah, so and try we to, it very much. And we try to expedite them where we can, and, and try because yeah. they're coming we and going. We still go through lot. security. A lot of people yeah. ask us if we have to go through security or if we get, you know, special treatment. We do not. We go through security like everybody else, and I think it's the right thing to do. And we're developing a program. Let me intercede. Called Registered Traveler, where frequent flyers can pay an annual fee of anywhere from 60 to to $100, and they'll be able to go through a special lane uh, for screening. Right. Because frequent flyers are smarter travelers. They don't show up with empty guns in their purse and say, gee, I didn't know it was there. <laughs> are you kidding? That actually or, happens. Or, or, or the gentleman that tried to bring the chainsaw onto the airplane. True story. <laughs> What's the problem? There's no gas in it. I think uh, there are a couple of reasons why the Republicans did not support the bond. One is uh, Republican philosophy, and that's the basic reason. And I don't know if we'll ever get past that reason, and that's that the Republicans don't believe in bond financing. They don't believe in debt. They don't believe in borrowing. They believe in a concept called pay as you go, which means that you only pay for what you have in the coffers at the time, uh, which for capital construction is really foolhardy in my view. I mean, I've worked in capital construction for a long time, and you know, if you don't do bonding, the kinds of dollars involved, you just aren't going to get that out of the tax base. But that's their belief. And so they, it's hard to convince Republicans to go with that. So there's a philosophical problem. And then secondly, um, some of the things that, we, uh, that, they, uh, that were spoken in terms of the investments, they did disagree with. Um, I think that part, uh, there may be some room. There were also some of the things in the bond that they wanted in terms of authorities for the governor that the Democrats were not willing to give. For instance, they, uh, and I don't know if they were willing to give this either, but there were, there were some, some authorities uh, as far as uh, concepts, or actually authorities called design build and uh, which is a, a way of privatizing the concept. They wanted a lot more privatization, in essence, of state work. They wanted to send, and this is consistent with what is being done at the federal level. So it's a very parallel kind of um, process that was being proposed, where, where, whereas in the past, uh, pro federal dollars and state dollars for projects were, are, are basically uh, done with state employees or with involvement of state employees, they wanted to use private companies like Halliburton is a good example in, in uh, Iraq. That's a very good example, the Iraq Halliburton thing. And so that was a big sticking point and big problem. It may, actually, you and I can talk about the design build thing privately because I know a lot about it and there's... You and I can talk about that privately. There is real, the jury is, because I don't want to bore everybody else, I have a lot of data on that issue. And actually the jury is out on the success failure rate of design build. Just in a nutshell, it is the, it is the, it is the, proposal du jour. It is the idea du jour. You know, we go through these cycles of solution du jour, and that is the solution du jour. But as far as hard data on, um, on um, more uh, economic uh, savings and more uh, success in the public sector, in the private sector, it absolutely makes sense. Whether that translates in the public sector, you and I can have some conversations about that. On design build? No, no, on uh, November. November. On the bond, I, I'm, not t I'm not super optimistic, but I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It really depends on if there's a will on the part. So what do you think uh, the chances are, 50-50? 50-50. Uh, 
The levy, well, there's a, there's a solution on the levy that's on the table now. We know we have to do something about levies because this problem is actually worse in California than it is in New Orleans. I think students don't realize that most of the levies aren't around here. No, they're, they're not here. here. No. They're in the Northern California. But actually, Sacramento Bay Delta, the Sacramento Delta area, actually has a worse flooding problem than New Orleans. If there were to be a flood, uh, a big, big rain, or a storm uh, of some kind on or the magnitude. Earthquake. Or an earthquake, but not even an earthquake, just major, major storming. Major storming in the mountains. There are two, ma there are mountain ranges there that if it flooded, if the conditions were right for rain followed by heat that melted the snows, there are two rivers that converge in the Sacramento Delta. The, the, and those rivers would flood the Bay Delta, and the, the levees there are over 100 years old, and they're made of dirt. And they would flood not into agricultural areas, but into where homes have been built, foolishly. But they've been built, and they are not insured, and we would have a catastrophe much greater than in New Orleans. So we have to do something about those levies, and it costs lots of money, and so we will have to do something about those in the short term. And so right now, there is a bill going through the legislature to allocate a billion dollars uh, for levy, which is a down payment. Uh, we will have to do a bond for the levies. I, that's separate inside from whatever else we do. That is something that will have to be done. Yeah, Daniel, you had a question? Uh, it's not that complicated, but... Uh, what, you're... Is there any chance that in California you can get money from Enron? Uh, well, so you like know... California can get money from Enron. Enron, yeah. Well, they did rip us off. You're absolutely right. But they're like, no, no longer exists. They no longer exist. Uh, they are, you know, I don't think there's going to be anything to take because the people who were involved are being prosecuted on a criminal basis. You know, white collar crime, they may go after them for their own personal assets, but that's not going to do anything for California, unfortunately. Yeah, we did. Well, we did. The Attorney General joined uh, with a number of other states in suing. Um, I don't know, actually. Do you know? No. I don't know. I don't know. I was involved at the front end on that when no one, no one believed that they were gaming the system. That was when I first came, my first year in the legislature, I was put on a three-member panel to investigate the energy crisis. And we did a lot of digging, and we, and we found a lot of dirt, but no one would listen to us. We had proof back then, and no one would listen to us. So um, um, any other questions? It was really a tough time. So what, what, what are the issues during your campaign right now that, that you are? Because um, yeah. you're running against another Democrat. So right. how, do you, how do you run against another Democrat? Um, by distinguishing myself on my record, which is very, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work on, a, on in a couple of areas. I've been uh, very involved as a leader. I've, I've been fortunate to, to have a very high profile very early. And by that I mean I've been a leader in some very important areas, like transportation. I've been a leader in that area. And I've been able to bring dollars to our area for things like some improvements on the 405 freeway and down in Wilmington to get money for the Pacific Coast Highway for great separations that we really needed. And uh, so bringing resources to the community uh, has been very important to me in the transportation area. And air quality is, a, is, a, is another area where I've taken leadership and want to continue to do air quality in terms of health, you know, childhood asthma and, um, and, and cancers. You know, we finally have made the, it, from a, a, a medical point of view, we've made the connection between particulate matter that comes out of the refineries and, um, and the ports and do respect the airport um, and cancers. And so we know that it's carcinogenic. And so now we have a new challenge to clean up the air because it's about people dying and health, you know. So I'm, I'm doing important work in that area. And, and, the, and so the environment, air quality, uh, transportation, and education and, and access. You know, uh, I, I, I want to just say a word about my friend who passed away, sure. okay? Because uh, 
two, a couple of days ago, um, one of my former colleagues, Marco Antonio Firebaugh, some of you may know his name, he passed away. He had liver uh, disease and he was 39 years old and he was a legislator and he did work uh, for all of you and for all students. He, um, and he cared a lot about these issues too and uh, we worked together on them and now I feel like I've got work to do on my own and with new partners. Um, he was committed, as I am, to making sure that, and I know LMU is committed to this, so I'm, you know, as an institution, fortunately you are at an institution that's a Jesuit institution that believes that no matter what your citizenship status, you have a right to an education, but in the UC that wasn't the case. It isn't always the case, and we have a lawsuit going on now about it. But this man, uh, along with support from people like me, who really care about this and will carry the banner on, um, fought for a thing called uh, Leticia A, the Leticia A bill, which allowed um, immigrants who were undocumented to access the University of California and uh, because the regents didn't want to do that. And, um, so, so this allowed them to pay in-state tuition. That's state right. It, allow, it allows them, the as a, if, they're, if they're here under certain conditions for a certain amount of time, but basically they could go to the university and afford to go to the university, basically, uh, without having to be an out-of-stater and pay, you know, prohibitive fees, et cetera. And, uh, and, and these are the kinds of things that are, are going to be the reason why I think I'm going to get elected versus my opponent, because I'm highlighting the leadership that I've taken on these issues. And my opponent's a good man, and, and I say nothing negative, but he's not been the kind of, like an aggressive leader. He's been a good man, a good Democrat, uh, but not out there being aggressive <laughs> about taking action. And you know, that's just the kind of energetic person that I am, and that's sort of why I'm here. You know, it's not just to push a button and vote. It's to like get things done. And I think that's what's going to convey Dr. Guerra. And that's the difference and the distinction that I'm going to try and make. And hopefully the voters will see it. And hopefully that's what will happen like it has been happening for the last 18 years. Let me ask so. you just a couple more questions. Um, the infrastructure of the campaign, you're going to spend $800,000. How, how, how many uh, people live in the district? Like well, there are uh, living in the district. The district's a little larger than a congressional seat, if you can imagine. The so Senate. Eight hundred, nine hundred thousand. Yes, it's about nine hundred thousand people who live in a in a Senate seat these days. That's slightly larger than a congressional seat. That's more people than live in the whole state of Alaska, <laughs> in places like, and uh, and other states as well. Yeah. So the and Vermont. And the, She's from Vermont. My campaign manager over here. So this is Emily Tenenbaum, by the way. Stand up, Emily. Emily is a, she's, she's young, but she is spunky, man. Uh, she, uh, she graduated from University of Delaware, and she came by way of Emily's List, if any of you have heard of that, and she's been trained out of Emily's List, and she's my campaign coordinator. So she's from Vermont, which is smaller than my district. Yeah, so, uh, so these, are, these are large districts. I mean, they're larger than, you know, there are at least five governors who get elected in smaller districts than right. this one. Um, right. And so, you, how do you how do you communicate to the voters in such a large district? How, how are you going to go about doing that? What, what's Several ways. Uh, okay. Yeah. What's the campaign strategy? Not the specific strategy, yeah, yeah. but just in general, yeah. generically. What we do is we we do uh, mar uh, targeted mailing, which is that we talk to voters by mail about issues that we think they care about. Um, so we. We do that. We're also going to do some cable television commercials. Um, we're also going to do, uh, we hope, we're going we're to be up on the net. We're going to have a website that we're putting together now uh, so people can, you know, email in. And uh, then we're also going to have um, a field operation, which is critical and really important. That's the grassroots. We're going to have two, we have two offices that we're opening up. Are actually, we're going to open them on April 8th. Uh, is our grand opening. Uh, we've got one office in Venice. Um, it's at the Venice Peace Center, which is on Lincoln, just off of Venice Boulevard. And then we have one uh, in Torrance, on Torrance Boulevard, just off of Venice, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
So right, right by the nest. Anyway, so we have these two offices. We're going to open them both up on the 8th. And what we do there is a couple things. We do precinct walking, which is knocking on doors of voters and giving out brochures which talk about me. And then we identify voters. And then on election day, we get them out if they're a yes vote for Jenny. And then we also talk to people on the phone. We do phone banks. And we also oh, do. Oh, yeah, they, they know how to phone call. So they have uh, Oh, you did that for him on a survey or something, a poll yeah, or whatever? Yeah, they really liked it. So, um. Cool. <laughs> Well, it's, it's fun, and we do, you know, ID. What we do is what's called voter ID. So we call and we, you know, talk about me a little bit, and then we say, you know, have you made up your mind? And then based on that, we, we uh, you know, we track them. And then on election day, we remind them to vote. And we actually, actually, it's really fun on election day because we actually can actually go to people's house and remind them to vote. And, like, so I've had experiences like, the woman with the baby who says, oh, you know, I can't go because my baby is, you know, sleeping or whatever. And, and then I've said, okay, well, you know, I'll give you a ride. You can take the baby with and, you know, I'll watch her while you're voting. And, and she's gone. I mean, it's very exciting when you know you have made the difference and you have helped somebody actually, you know, cast their vote as a citizen and, and you know, actually experience that experience. It is really exciting. Election night, election day is a phenomenal experience. So, and so is building up to it. It's really a thrill so and where's fun. where's the uh, election night party going to be? We haven't decided yet. Okay. We don't know. Because we all want to go. Well, you're not invited unless you work. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Okay. Guerra. Okay. Um, I'm working right now. It's like, yeah. Cornelius. Very difficult. That's a great question. It's very difficult. You, I spend a lot of time on the telephone. Uh, this, this takes, and, and women out there, if you want to run for, I'm going to tell you, it is harder for women than men. Why? Because we have to get out, out of our psychology of always being the givers and not the takers. No offense, men, but you guys are way more comfortable you know, getting taken care of and asking. Women are just, we are programmed not to ask, All culturally. Right, not my wife, I mean, just. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she should run for office then. <laughs> um, but no, really, uh, just socialization, our socialization, uh, maybe it's getting better with you guys, but when I grew up, it was very hard for me to get over that attitude. Now, I got no problem, but it's 18 years, you know. You have to ask people, Cornelius, you have to ask people. And, uh, so how and do you ask someone for money? I call them up on the phone. I call them up and I'd say, Dr. Guerra, and I, I, Dr. Guerra, I'm calling to tell you that I'm running for Senate. I'm very excited. The campaign's going great, and you know why I'm running. I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm calling to ask you for your help. Sure. What can, can I do? Can you, you know, I, the, that campaign's really expensive, and I'm hoping that you can help me uh, with a check for a thousand dollars. What? A thousand dollars. And he, uh, yeah, you know what? They'll, they'll, they'll take my whole Loyola month's salary. Well, you know, I I, I was kind of hoping I was kind of hoping that you could do a thousand dollars. The limits are thirty three hundred. Okay, I'll do a thousand. But, <laughs> but I know that you can't you, that you're on a faculty salary, and so I wouldn't ask you for thirty three hundred dollars. But if you can manage a thousand dollars, maybe you could send me five hundred this month and five hundred next also, month. Also, how about a credit card? I accept credit cards. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> See, you just have to work it. And you know, it's hard. You have to get over all that stuff. I also have events, you know, like I'm having a luncheon on Saturday, and it's, you know, $100 a ticket. And, and we're doing a women's event for Women's History Month. And, you know, so we do it that way too. We have How about just volunteers? I mean, I volunteers are, you know, volunteers are the heart of the campaign. And, and when you're in a close race, like I might be, uh, I'll give you the best example of this. Volunteers uh, make the difference in close campaigns. Um, I'll give you the, the best example. John Kennedy, everybody knows who John Kennedy was, right? <laughs> you're young, but you're not that young. John Kennedy was elected in a very, very close election in 1960. His elect, or 1959 actually. Uh, uh, his election was so close that he won, well, well, let me back up and say, 
the way people vote is you go to a poll at a place, right, in, in a neighborhood. You go to a polling place in a neighborhood. That polling place is at a precinct. It's called a precinct, a neighborhood. And, and the whole United States is divided into precincts, all right, all these neighborhood polling places. John Kennedy won the election for president by less than one vote per precinct. He became president of the United States by less than one vote per precinct. Now, in my situation for Senate, grassroots campaigning, the thing that I said about going door to door and reminding people about the vote or calling them on the phone on election day, there is no doubt that Every person who calls people on election day has gotten at least one person to go to the polls that otherwise would not have. There's no doubt because one of the people that you've touched will have been thinking, eh, I'm not gonna go, or had forgotten that it was election day, or was just thinking it didn't matter. And by you calling that person, you make the difference. You remind them, or you just give them that little push. And just think of if you didn't do that. Richard Alarcon, a member of the Senate today, he won the Senate by 27 votes. Out of how many casts? Out of I how many casts? There was like uh, 200,000. 200,000 votes. 27 votes. That's how much volunteering matters. Ray, did That's you want to, how you, you want to volunteer? There's only maybe two or three projects that we're going to restudy, and the community is going to be involved in that restudy. One of the important things is we're talking about infrastructure is connecting light rail into the airport. We're moving about 14,000 people a day off the green line into the airport on a bus. A lot of employees, a lot of employees. So uh, the mayor is very pragmatic about this, and he said, you know, let's look at the simple things that we need to do to get that airport to work, because I don't think we're going to have 80 or 90 million passengers through there. I just don't think it's going to happen, because there's too many, uh, uh, look, well, there's a lot of things, I'm hesitating. I mean, it's the old story. Everybody, we serve just about every city that you can imagine internationally and uh, domestically. So. It just, it will grow incrementally, but it's not going to grow that much. The other airports are going to take it on. So there is nothing that fell off the table. There's nothing on the table. We're just going to look at what we need to do to speed up the terminal. You know, the, the three south side terminals, one, two, and three, under the old plan, they were going to be demolished. So we didn't do anything. And the minute uh, the new mayor came in and Lydia Kennard, who's our new executive director, the mayor appointed her, first thing we talked about was cleaning up Terminal 3, which is Alaska Airlines, and, and some of those terminals, we're spending $2.5 million just painting and putting carpet in, things uh, like that. Uh, all of the in-line, uh, well, when you check your bag, you got to go drag it through one of those uh, CTX machines. Okay, that's all going to be behind the ticket counter over the next two, three years. We're spending uh, $500 million to do that. $500 million? Yeah, we're going to spruce up. It's a, hmm? Ground access is a function of the community, regional authorities and all, and uh, we're willing to work. Our, the plans that we looked at tried to support that. You know, th there's a lot more traffic on the 405 and the 105. Coming off the 105 in the morning, the 105 freeway, if you're familiar with it, it goes up to Sepulveda, less than 15% of the traffic coming off that freeway is going to the airport. The rest is using Sepulveda and other thoroughfares as transportation because the freeways can't handle it. I mean, we, you're absolutely right when you say we can't build our way out of this thing. We've got to go and do what other cities around the world are doing. I mean, you just can't make 20-lane freeways. It just doesn't work. We, need, we want to bring rail in. Uh, you know, you look at the major airports around the world. London Heathrow, Hong Kong, and go down the list, uh, Paris. They all have rail. They all have other modes of transportation. 
you know, LAX unfortunately is the dubious honor of having more vehicles per day coming through it than any other airport in the world. Yeah. So, hey, Jenny, let me ask him, we'll end with this. Uh, the uh, high speed rail to LAX and then out to Van Nuys and Palmdale and then to the rest of the state. Yeah. I mean, w what's your position on that? Oh. I'm very supportive of it. I want it. I want to see high-speed rail go, and we're, the bond is supposed to go in 08, and I'm very supportive of keeping it on the on the uh, agenda for 08. Let me just say one more word about um, the last word. The last word is the thing that I didn't say about all the stuff about you know grassroots campaigning and all that is that it's fun that it really is a lot of fun, and we have a great time out there. And so if any, any of you guys want to come and join us, uh, you'll find out for yourself that it's, you meet new people and you have a great time, and it's not just, you know, a lot of work, it's also a lot of fun. So let's give so. our two guests a hand. Thank you.